Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. This is the show about all things making music. On today's show, I have a great guest, Carlos Sosa. Carlos started the brass group Grooveline Horns. They have a sample pack on Splice, which is magnificent. They've played and recorded for groups like Jason Mraz, Zach Brown Band, Kelly Clarkson, Maroon 5, so many more, adding their kind of signature R&B funk sound to their music. You've heard many songs with his playing on it before, I'm sure. Carla shared a lot of the mental ideas and the mindset things that have led to his success. He's a great guy, lots of fun to talk to. I hope you enjoy this episode with Carlos Sosa. All right, Carlos, great to see you again, man. Hey, what's so up? So happy we're finally doing this. I know, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, I'm excited it's you asked me to in. do it, man. I was just like, I, I saw, you know, you have your little clips that, that, that come out on social media. I'm just like, oh, man, this is so cool. And then you're <laughs> like, you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, man, absolutely. So I'm excited. I'm a big Brian Funk fan. <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. Um, you know, we met through the Berkeley class. I teach that. Was it the sampling class at that point? No, the Ableton it, sample, or is it the? Uh, I think it was kind of a. It, I think it was the in, uh, Ableton. It was the intro to Ableton, or able. It was called um, Advanced Techniques, or or maybe. Yeah, I took all of them. It was after the intro, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. I think uh, Loudon was the first. Loudon was first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a yeah. funny time in my life because I I had a... I remember purchasing Ableton uh, like five years prior. And I installed it. And I was like, cool, is this new DAW great? And I, I couldn't figure out how to press play. <laughs> and like how to get anything happening and i was like man i'm just gonna go back i've been using pro tools since sound tools you know mm. and uh well i got mine early too i was i got pro tools in like 2005 you know when i first got a laptop i didn't know anything about anything you know just been recording the old way right. um with mixers and like hardware recorders uh, but it did come with Live 4, I think. And it looked like a spreadsheet to me. I thought it was <laughs> DJ software, and, and I didn't really ever open it. You know, just yeah. looked at it once. I was like, I'm not going to be using this. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> yeah, and then I remember, um, I remember I was touring with Kelly Clarkson, and uh, they were using, the MD was using Ableton for playback. And then I, I was looking... I kept looking at what he was doing. It looked so colorful and cool. And like, it's like, what are you using? Cause it didn't look like my Ableton. You know? <laughs> yeah. But, and uh, he's like, Oh, Ableton. I was like, and then I, I just had this thing where I was like this kind of uh, anger that uh, there is something there that I didn't know how to use. You know what I mean? <laughs> so then, right. uh, and then I heard people talking about production with Ableton. I was like, man, I've got to get this happening. So I, so I, I looked at the Berkeley online program and, and I was like, okay, all this, the electronic music, music certification, I got to take all these things. And first off, I'm going to learn Ableton, you know, mm. and it was great. It, it really changed a lot of things for me. You're somebody I think of a lot when I say this to my class, because, you know, people come in the class, I always encourage everyone, you know, interact with each other. You never know who's in this class. Um, might be a future collaborator, somebody that you'll really connect with. And right. um, you know, when you came in the class and started talking about what you've done, playing with Kelly Clarkson, I think you were already playing Jason Mraz, some of the songwriting, I was kind of like, why, why am I in, why aren't I in your class, you know? <laughs> but I always think of you as like a good example to people like you, you should you net this is a networking thing too and it's a way to make friends and it's it's so important to have people that are like-minded like you that are into the same thing because in a lot of people's lives like they, they're not around like studio cats all the time and musicians that they can share their you know problems or questions with or just bounce ideas off of so true man i i um i've made some really great friends from my classes at Berkeley that I still keep in contact with whether it's professional or not, you know? Um, mm. and I, 
I've done a lot. I've worked in London a lot. There's a couple of producers I work with. And one of my, uh, it's funny because I was at the studio with this guy, Fraser T. Smith, a uh, monster producer, right? Did a lot of, used to play guitar for this guy, Craig David, this R&B guy that I was a big fan of back in the day. But now he's like a mo- super producer. Yeah, he does like, wrote a lot of the Adele stuff, just tons of stuff. So we started working together and I'm in the studio and I was, I said something about um, a Berkeley class and he looked at me, he's like, are you taking Berkeley classes? I was like, yeah. He goes, me too. I'm like, really? <laughs> he's like, we, we found out that we were both addicted to Berkeley classes, you know, and he was taking <laughs> piano, intro to piano and like, and it was, I mean, he, I think uh, Jimmy Kachulis, the songwriting, uh, songwriting professor, he was saying we were, we got really close too. And when I was taking the songwriting classes from Jimmy and he said, yeah, Frazier is in my classes. I actually had him come and come down and speak at Berkeley. And, and he was like, you guys, like, this is exactly what you were saying. Like, this guy's a super producer, you know, got Grammys, multiple, multiple number one hits all over the world. And he still take, he'll, you know, he would take any class just to learn. Mm-hmm. You know? So, uh, don't you think that has something to do with his success? That mentality? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Never stop learning. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I completely agree. And I, I know when uh, people are shocked when I tell them I still take classes, you know, I'm like, mm. why not? Like, this is what I do. And I want to learn as much as I can. And sometimes, you know, I'm not the best at something that I want to be better at. And I tell people all the time, like, the songwriting classes changed my life. That was something that I really wanted to do. And I had two of the, like, like, I mean, uh, Rod Temperton was one of my songwriting mentors before he passed. You know, we got really close. This guy changed the world, you know? And Michael Jackson. Yeah. You know, and he, you know, he would tell me things that I didn't really, didn't really understand at the time. But then after I started taking classes and really like, I didn't want to be defeated by this songwriting thing. I thought it was like a gift people had that I couldn't do. And, uh, the songwriting classes, it one in particular, the, the, um, the harmony class changed my life. And, um, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, man, what is it? 12 week class? Mm-hmm. Well, most classes are 12 weeks. I'm like, look in 12 weeks, you will have so much knowledge. Like that is worth any amount of money, you know? Right. Um, and that's what happened with it, all of my Berkeley classes, man. It just, they, it, it's, you know, you, they, there's, there's, I find those classes are like comprised of people that, uh, you know, some of them don't, you know, they're, they're just like any college. Like they don't really care. They're not going to apply themselves or whatever, but there's people, there's a, a, a high percentage of people that are there to just kill it. And that's mm-hmm. super inspiring. You know, where else are you going to get in the, the guys like you that are teaching the classes that really have the knowledge, it's, it's, it's awesome. So, um, yeah, I digress. <laughs> I find it so inspiring on my end, you know, like you said, some of those people are there to kill it and they do. And, you know, at week after week, listening to their work, um, and you know, for me, it's the same assignments each right. semester, but it's always so different and it, it's never dry. It's never old. And, I sometimes feel like I'm walking away learning the most, you know, because I'm going through everyone's work. It's such a valuable experience on that, that end too. That's cool, man. I have a, a friend that I've worked with for a long time that started teaching a couple of years ago, moved to Boston and teaching songwriting. And uh, he had me come and uh, I guess he had to do some video stuff with his classes. Um, his name's Rodney Alejandro. Brilliant brilliant guy. And then, uh, I remember taking a song songwriting class, uh, with Sarah Brindell and she said, would you like to, uh, can we, can you create something for like, for one of her classes? So it was like a video that she edited. So she shows all her classes now. Uh, and mm-hmm. it was like, I think it was like horn arranging for pop songs or something like that, you know, for a beginner songwriter. Nice. And I did that and it was, and then Rodney was like, man, you should come up with a class, man, write a, write a class for Berkeley, you know, online. And then, so we kind of, 
I was talking to my buddy Jeff Coffin, who's the sax player for Dave Matthews, and he does a lot of that education stuff for Belmont University and stuff in Nashville. He's like, man, I'll help you too. That sounds awesome. And then I'm like, yeah. I'm like, man, I kind of don't want to give away my secrets. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> um, but I don't know, man. It, it might be something I do in the future. I mean, I love it all, you know. So. You know, I think... Uh, something I've kind of learned by giving away my secrets <laughs> is, <laughs> you know, is like it forces you kind of not to rely on them and to learn new secrets and keep growing, really. Um, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, whatever, all all your skills, all your talents, all your background, all your experience, it's probably not going to be uh totally given away it's not just what you're going to say and teach i mean there's also just the blood sweat and tears that go into that too but sometimes identifying them and putting words to them and putting processes to them i think helps me understand what i'm doing a lot better too yeah for sure i i you know when i really think about it it's like look you can give anybody a method but actually that person um you know, A, that's your method, which is could possibly not be the only way or the best way. But for somebody to implement it creatively and effectively is another story as well, you know? Mm. So, um, you know, interesting yeah. for me to hear because um, I know you're very well educated. You have a lot of experience. You, you know your stuff. You know your chops. What were some of the valuable lessons you got about songwriting through your classes? Your Rod Temperton, like, I'm like, what, what were some of the big takeaways for you? Well, um, I, the, the thing that I, I kind of have honed without knowing uh, in my entire career was melody. Like I have a, a, a pretty, that, that, that gave me like a superpower coming into songwriting, you know? Um, because I was, I, that's what I do. That's what I've right. always, that's what I've done in my professional career. Like when you think about horn arranging, um, at least, I mean, I kind of self taught myself, you know, I taught myself, how to do this because I grew up listening to earth, wind and fire and James Brown and cameo and Ohio players and tower of power, like all these horn bands. That's what I wanted to do. So I kind of figured out my own method to get that product, like to get, to figure that out. And, and for me, it is, uh, you know, it's, um, and then through experience, like, is this, uh, uh, something that the horns are prominent, like, or am I doing a pop record where I'm accompanying and making the song better? Regardless, it starts with a melody. So if there's, if I'm doing a chorus for a pop song, it, you know, I, there's the vocal, there's the vocal hook, which is the main thing. So if I'm doing a counter, I'm either going to do a counter melody, melody or I'm going to do some pads or something. Or, and, but regardless, I have to write a melody, a strong melody either way. And then I just voice it with other horns. So, and am I going to do a unison line? Am I going to do, uh, am I going to harmonize these sections or whatever? So I've been doing that, you know, since college. And so I came into songwriting and I did take the mel melody class, but these were all things that were the mel the melody class was, um, already kind of ingrained in me. I was like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, mm. that's what I do. So every every lesson was like, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you know. Uh, right. That was Brass a big thing. too. Yeah. And they're, was, they're monophonic, right? So they're all melody. That's the thing. It's like you start with the melody. And then, and then th that's the biggest thing in songwriting, too, or one of the biggest things is like the melody is the king. Like that's it. If you don't have a strong melody, you don't really have much, you know. Mm. Um, and that was one of the things that Rod Temberton, that was his biggest thing. He had, um, one of his, his, uh, big things was, uh, I, you know, I, I started asking him about songwriting. He said, well, I'll tell you, I write everything, all the music 
first. I don't care about the lyrics. I don't, and this is his process. It's not that it works for everybody, but, um, I've never changed. He's like, you know, he'll write the melody and the chords underneath. And then he, he said, I've never changed a note or a rhythm to fit in a lyric. And he said, I let the, the music tell me what the words are going to be, which I didn't understand mm. at the time. Cause I wasn't a songwriter. I wasn't attempting to be a songwriter at that time. And then he said, one thing that is, I mean, again, this is his process and I'm not saying that this goes for everybody, but it floored me. And then I, mm. I started listening to some of the stuff he wrote or whatever. And I got it. He said, if your melody is good enough, nobody cares what you're saying. <laughs> and it, that was like a revelation to me because of course you want to write a story. You want to have a story and strong lyrics that mean something, but you don't have to get so caught up in it that, that it's, uh, you know, it's the most important thing. I mean, it's all important. You want to write the best song that you can, but it's, if you listen back to like always and forever by heat wave, you know, that song, uh, always and forever um it's a ballad i don't know not not ringing a bell if you heard it you would you would know what time period was that oh 1974 okay that was rod temperton's band um and they the long story of how they met and how they started but uh they were it was uh he met a bunch of guys at a german uh air force base in and uh, they were from Ohio and they started this band and they were playing covers. They started writing their own songs uh, and that they put out a record and it was just smash, like just took over the planet. And that's how mm -hmm. he started working with Michael Jackson. Cause he got, people started calling him Quincy Jones, called them all this stuff because of that record. And always and forever was one of the first songs I heard when I was a kid that changed my life. I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> that's cool. And he, and then if you listen to it, the melody is so strong and it's a love song. But if you listen to the lyrics and then you know that Rod Temperton, that's his method, it's just a love song. So it's like you have this beautiful melody and you could play it on a piano and it'll almost make you cry because it's so beautiful. And you're just, okay, let's write some lyrics. You listen to the lyrics. Mm. It's not a really, it's not a story. It's a love song. Like, your brain goes into a mode to where let's write romantic lyrics. And that's what you do. You know, that's what he, that you could tell in that song. That's what they did. And it's awesome. It makes sense to the listener. Everybody. I feel like if the lyrics that you put on a, on a song, it, it, it paints a picture in the listener's head, you know, mm -hmm. it's their experience that they connect to not, there's no way they're going to get your experience. So you, anyway, mm. I digress with all that stuff, but that was, uh, that, the melody thing for me was a revelation, you know? Hmm. Well, I guess you're letting the music, you know, it's got a feeling already, right? It's got a mood and you just kind of listen to it and then take it from there. Absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. I think I do that a lot myself, actually. Um, it it always seems like if I go the other way, I'm trying to shoehorn things in there, squeeze it in. Um, the things I like the best are the more organic kind of, a lot of times if I'm trying to come up with vocals, I'm just kind of blabbering until I find yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then when you start writing, co-writing with people and that's what everybody does. Everybody does it, you know? And, uh, yeah. you know, like, like, <laughs> you have a melody and then you start, you start, you know, everybody just starts throwing like phrases at this great melody. And like, what's the word that fits in there or the phrase that fits in this melody? That's the hook, you yeah. know? Mm. And so if it's like a, a slow ballad, like you're, you're, you have a, a mood in your brain and your, your, your brain just kind of by association just kind of puts out these like sad or romantic lyrics, you know? It's fascinating yeah. to me. Um, anyway. Yeah, and it is. You, you kind of just have to go for it and not worry too much about 
you know, because you, you can always change it, right? But yeah. you need something to work with. And I know I always get stuck when I start trying to be clever or I start yeah. trying to, you know, like be intelligent. I'm trying to incorporate, but it always get that gets in the way of feeling what's happening. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's, you get I'm lucky not thinking with that. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, but I've, <laughs> yeah. It, I find I, uh, the blabbering will often just get me the sounds I need, the syllables. Yeah. You know, the where's the consonant? Where's the vowel? Where's the longer word? And um, then, you know, if you do it long enough, sometimes you just say something good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I remember uh, I heard recently that Leonard Cohen had written uh, for Hallelujah, he had written something like 80 verses or something. And it took him like 10 wow. years to, to get, or I, even more than that. I don't know, but it took mm -hmm. him, um, he had written that song. It took him years, I think around 10 years to, to finish that, that song. That's what I heard. Um, that's interesting. So he's almost just narrating the music for a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. The, the, when he starts saying like, uh, the chords he's hitting, yeah. you know, <laughs> um, the major the, lift. And then there's there's uh, Jason Mraz who wrote his biggest hit in ten minutes. You know, it's like, uh huh. Uh, it's amazing, man. Yeah, uh, sometimes like you're just there to receive it. Yeah, I've been there actually too, mm. a long time ago. But that's happened to me, which is really cool. Mm. Yeah, it's not something I think you can wait out for. <laughs> you gotta yeah, sometimes yeah. get to work. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> just wait. <laughs> One, once in a while, the lightning bolt hits you, but <laughs> <laughs> for sure, I haven't found like a long enough piece of metal to hold in the air to make that happen reliably. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got a pretty sick sound pack on Splice, oh, yeah. the, the Groove Line Horns. Groove Line is the name of your group. Yeah, Groove Line Horns. Right, the, yeah. the three guys. You guys uh -huh. are a team. I love the video you have on the splice channel too oh, um, thanks i put links to that in the show notes um but you can tell you guys are having a lot of fun yeah it was fun it was fun doing that i loved it uh it's uh that it's funny because that was an i don't know why i keep going back to rod temperton but the way i met him was i was doing a a, a concert that of with an artist in london and one of she was doing a she was uh doing heat wave she was playing always and forever that song i was telling you as a as a acoustic piece with a piano player and her singing the singing the the song and like two songs before like during the show two songs before she goes i have a great i have a great idea you want to play a solo on always and forever and we're at royal Albert. Albert Hall and like the Queen of England's there, and I'm just like, I don't even know what key it's in. Wow, you know what key she's singing? I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I played, you know, I played and went fine. But um, I'm at the bar at the after party, and I order a drink, and I feel a tap on my shoulder, and uh, somebody, like, I didn't turn around, and somebody kind of speaks in my ear and says, I believe you owe me some royalties. And I turn around, I was like, for what? And he goes, you named your horn section after one of my songs. I'm Rod Temperton. And I was like, first off, I thought he was black. Cause <laughs> he, he wasn't, he was this, huh. you know, he was this English guy. And I just, my jaw dropped. And I did when I was in college, I named my horn section after one of his songs. Wow. So, yeah. So, so wait, that night you played for the, Queen of England. She was and in, Rod Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was he it was a record of, of covers that she this woman was named Be Beverly Knight and it's uh she is like the Beyonce of the UK. She's an amazing singer. She was Prince's favorite female singer. Hmm. Um and she had she did an album. She's massive. Now she does a lot of acting. And she um she had a record release and she did, she did an album of covers of songs that influenced her in her life. And there was like a Jamiroquai song and George Michael song. And then 
Heat Wave, Rod Temberton, and she had um, invited all of the original artists to come to the show as well. Mm. That's why he was there. Wow. So you said you didn't even know the key, but you said yes anyway. How different would things have turned out if you would have said no? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think she had, she had, she probably introduced us as, you know, at the end of the night as Groove Lion Horns or something like that. And that's why he had known that, um, what the name of the horn section was. But when things like that happen, you know, if you're in the throes of the year right there and somebody asks you to like the person that hires you and writes your check and the massive artist asks you to do something kind of can't say no. So if you fall, uh -huh. if you okay. fall flat, you fall flat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just had to do it. I mean, I was petrified. This was probably <laughs> one of the scariest moments of my life. Um, hmm. But uh, it went well. Trust when me, you got out there, did you have fun or was it just terrifying? <laughs> I don't remember. I'm pretty sure I, I, well, I have this thing too. It's like, I have a lot of terrifying moments like that. Like on tour, I, you know, I play in front of a lot of people on a consistent basis. I don't really get nervous a lot, but sometimes I do. And it's like, you kind of just, you get in this, this state where you're just like, screw it. Like, Mm. it's, I have to like, like, I have to make this happen. You know, it's like you, you, uh, your body feels full of adrenaline and you're just like, I got this. Like you have to, you have to like, you have to put yourself in a completely different, like whatever insecurities you have, whatever, anything is going on in your brain at the time, you have to completely like separate yourself from that. It's like a, a Zen moment and you just go out there and just, you know, it's like a, I would say it's probably like a football team. Like I'm the man I can do this. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, I've had a, yeah, it, it, it's a interesting mental game. You have to play with yourself. You know, I've never gotten to play for, I didn't get to play for the queen of England or <laughs> Rod Temperton, <laughs> but I, I know what you mean a little bit. And it's almost like that feeling when you drive home and you don't remember how you got home, you know, yeah. cause you're not really thinking about it. You're just kind of, you, you go into the, I don't know, the practice or the, um, you know, all those rehearsals, they just kind of come through and you just almost have to get out of the way <laughs> and let it, let it happen. Yeah. You're definitely on, you know, you know, you're on autopilot at that point, you, you know, practicing so much and, and big pop shows and, and shows like that. Like you, by the time you hit the stage, you've got, you have to have everything up here on autopilot. But it's funny what you said um, about driving home and not remembering this past summer was one of the first tours that I'd done since the pandemic. And it was with Jason Mraz and I have a, moment in the show where you know there's probably a 11 piece 12 piece band and there's a moment in the show that i kind of created um and it's just the whole band would stop and i would play by myself for a minute or uh, maybe five minutes whatever what ho however i had to, and then the drummer would come in and it would be me and the drummer and the drummer he's new to Jason, but he had been a friend. He's been a friend of mine for like 15 years and he's a monster. So then we would start playing together and it was this moment. And then the rest of the band would come in and join us and the, the song would go on. But I took that as like, I mean, I played in cover bands for a really long time and I, and, um, you expect, and especially being on a tour like that on a, like you play the same thing every night, you know, mm -hmm. and it's almost scripted. It's like, it's not literally scripted, but it's, there's no, there's not a lot of, like, say you go to a Taylor Swift concert, there is no improvising going on on that stage. You know what I mean? And for, mm -hmm. for us, for a lot of musicians, that's kind of where we get our creativity as far as playing, you know, or, you know, we, that's where we, we, we kind of like connect with the universe that way and connect with musicians and, you know, you have fun that way. 
And uh, so with, and Jason's super cool that he's like, man, everybody do whatever you want as long as it's awesome and we can rock. And I'm like, yeah. So Mm -hmm. I created that moment and it started, it was, it was a big hit. Like the, the fans loved it. The, the crowds were going crazy. And I, I had to do different. Like I had to really put myself in this spot to where I didn't want it to be the same every night because I would do something. The drummer would hook up with me and we'd do this thing. And it would be amazing. Like when I'd, I would go walk on the riser with him and I'd put my, like I, he's already playing and then he would watch my feet. And every time I hit a step, he would hit his kick drum. And cool. <laughs> in the middle of this beat, like what a badass drummer, you know? And yeah. uh, we would have so much fun. And then people would be like, oh my God, you were like melting everybody's face. And I'm like, like that was so great. And I, and I remember consistently I would black out. Like, I don't know what I did. And they would say, mm-hmm. well, you got to hear the recording. I'm like, I don't want to listen to the recording because if I listen to the recording, I'm going to want to do the same thing the next night. And so every night I was trying to outdo myself and have a different cool moment with the same, with me and the drummer and the bass player or whatever. Some nights it didn't happen, you know, but I, I would say about 70% it happened, you know? Hmm. So anyway, I would completely lose. I would, I, I couldn't tell you what I, I, just played for 10 minutes straight and I couldn't tell you what I did. (laughs) (laughs) You just got in there. Yeah. Yeah. What a cool dynamic though, when to go away from that, I'm sure the audience picks up on that. Like, Oh, this is something we're getting tonight. Yeah. This is for us. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think big shows like that are, I mean, it's all about moments. I think, you know, for the crowd, of course, they want to hear the songs that they came to hear, but also to put on a great show. It's about moments, you know. Mm-hmm. We used to do this thing where we would come, we would have a a spot that the horn, like the special thing that I wrote, that the horns just like a horn feature, and I would we would pop up in the audience, different venues, like we'd pick before, like during sound check. Okay, we're gonna pop up over there, and then. So the, the lighting guy would know where we're going to be. But then when the venue's packed with people, all of a sudden spotlight comes in the middle of the crowd and then everybody's freaking out. Cause like horn, the, the horn players are like jamming right next to them and they loved it. And that's the thing. It's like, they're going to go home remembering that. Yeah. You know, of course they heard their right. songs, but that was awesome. You know? Uh huh. Surprise. Yeah. yeah. We didn't know we we're getting that. Yeah. Yeah. So I love doing stuff like that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, because I guess you do run the risk of bringing the same package. And I would imagine um, for you guys, it's a really invigorating moment. It's that part of the show that's that makes it stand out from the one we did last night and the one we're going to do tomorrow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, because you, you can easily get caught into the, in a rut of like, flipping a burger, the same burger every night, you know, doing the same thing uh-huh. after you do it. I mean, when, when I'm yours came out, it was, uh, we were on tour for two years straight, like all over the world. And so it's really easy to get caught up in doing the same show every night. And I don't think musicians want to do that. And I don't, you know, the crowd doesn't know any different really. Mm-hmm. Cause it, you know, uh, but, I try to be inspired every night and try to put on the best show you can. And if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, it could get kind of monotonous. So try to change it up and look, do different things and look forward to something new. Right. You guys running an Ableton type session, something like that with those shows? Uh, Jason. No, I don't think any of the bands this year I'm doing Zach Brown and Kenny Chesney, which is like a massive stadium tour, and uh, Jason, and I don't think, I don't think we've run tracks for anything. Actually, I think there's a point when Jason ran tracks, but now, uh, it's just like a sample pad of like little sonic things that we need, but no, no tracks. Mm-hmm. And then with Zach. 
we haven't really, I haven't really started rehearsals this year with any of them. I start next month. Um, so I, I'm not sure, but, um, the bands that I tend to play with, obviously, because there's a horn section involved are not, it's, you know, it doesn't, they're, they're more like musician bands rather than, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Where it, that's kind of the point is that you've got these like killers on stage. Yeah. Let them play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't run into that a lot. I, I think Kelly was a little different because she had a lot of electronic elements in her music mm -hmm. and, um, there was a lot of stuff synced to video stuff like that. Right. So, um, it wasn't all the time, but, and her records were so massively produced and string sections and stuff like that, that they wanted to deliver the recordings. The quality of the show would be like the exact recordings to the audience, you know, which is awesome too, mm -hmm. because, you know, with a, a live show, when you listen to the record so much, cause you're studying and you even, you know, whatever artist it is, um, it's cool to like have all those things in the performance, you know, in, in your, in your ears, you, you know, have all the little, um, you know, the, the electronic, uh, drops and stuff like that, you know, it's cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that kind of raises the emotional impact and brings things together. Yeah. And then I've done a, we did a couple of, um, uh, shows with like the LA Philharmonic and, and that's a whole different trip. That's super cool. Hmm. So, uh, we're going to do a couple of those with Jason here pretty this summer as well. Okay. Nice. So that's yeah. a much bigger band then. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. When you get to those. <laughs> I think last year we did, we did, uh, it was in New York. Um, I don't know what it was called. We did, a. uh, we did a symphony show in New York. It was in Queens, I think. The venue, I forgot the yeah, name. Of it. Forest Hills. Forest I think Hills. You were saying, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Forest Hills. <clears throat> and right. then uh, this year we're doing Red Rocks with the Denver Symphony, so it's going to be great. Uh, I, I always wanted to see a show there. Yeah, it seems like such a cool venue. It is super cool. It's uh, for a horn player. It's rough though because we have oxygen tanks on the side of the stage because it's. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. The, altitude. the altitude. Yeah, it sucks. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. You got to breathe. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you don't think about that as a guitar player. <laughs> yeah, you got it easy, man. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but Red Rocks is cool because it, it it's uh, every time I I mean I've played there probably about six or seven times, but the audience is like right there in front of you. It's so cool the way that mm. the the kind of amphitheater set up, it looks like there's just a wall of people in front of you instead of like yeah. a stadium where it's so, you know, spread out. Right. Right. I guess that can sometimes too much distance, you know, separates that energy a little bit. I tell people all the time, they're like, what is it like playing in front of 30,000 people at a stadium? It's like, like Zach, or I mean, we played Fenway park three nights in a row sold out, which is, 30,000 a night, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, sick. And I sometimes I'm like, honestly, it's harder to play in front of 50 people. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, when you play, when you, you can see everybody's eyes looking at you and you're in a room of 50 people, you know? And when you're right. on a stage that big, uh, I think like after like, I don't know, 5,000 people or 8,000, like it's just, a sea of people. So you might as, and then you have your, <clears throat> your in-ears in. So it's kind of like, you're not playing in front of anybody, mm. you know, but at least that's what I tell myself. So that's how I get through it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you think about it too hard, <laughs> yeah. you start to realize the scale of what's going on. Yeah. It can exactly. get to you, but that's the type of stuff you gotta let go when you get up there. Absolutely. But, you know, personally for me, um, seeing a show, I, I love the 
the smaller in your face kind of thing, even if it doesn't sound as good, just the, uh, you know, that absolutely the, the energy is closer and more personal. And like you said, you, you might make eye contact with them and they, they're, they're doing it for you. You're like a good percentage of why they're there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a, I still play, I have a residency here in Austin. Um, and I've got a kill in band and we play every Tuesday night at a small club and it's awesome. And I kind of, mm. you know, Prince used to do that. He used to, you know, go play a stadium and then he'd show up at a club with his band and they would play till six in the morning because it's that energy exchange with people that, you know, that you really get in a smaller setting, which is, that's kind of why we do what we do. Yeah. You see videos like that pop up on social media once in a while, like gigantic stadium acts will show up at a little bar or I, I saw one with like Green Day playing in the subway oh, station. Oh, I saw that with Jimmy Fallon. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. 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 yeah, so cool. And especially like a band like that, where that's kind of what they came out of playing in yeah. like sweaty halls for a bunch of kids as kids themselves. Yeah, I saw that. I think I, I don't know why it's been popping up on social media a lot, but I saw like a high school performance of theirs and I was like, they were incredible in high yeah. school. I've you know? seen that too. Yeah. 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 They can play. Uh, <laughs> they were, they're pretty serious. It's, that energy is, you know, that's just so fun. Yeah, for sure. I, we, we were talking about the sample pack. Um, mm -hmm. I remember, I mean, well, I guess before, like right when I was in college, you remember acid? Like the music? <laughs> no, <laughs> acid was like, a, it was a, the it was thing like a, that made the Joker, the, the thing from the sixties, <laughs> the thing <laughs> that they melted people with in breaking bad. No, um, <laughs> that stuff in the rain <laughs> acid was like a program, like a, a program. I mean, Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you know what I'm talking about? It was like this, yeah. It was software. Yeah. Like you, yeah. I, I remember. I never used it, but I, yeah, I, I got it. I think, it, you know, just to, mess around with it and i used it for a while I didn't, sony I mean, right I, I don't remember i didn't know what i was doing it was just like it would but you know you'd have this library of loops and you pull in this thing and then you like play you know mm. and that's when i was like man one day i want to do a sample pack like i would love to do an acid sample pack you know and i had just started recording horns and doing my thing getting into like i was in college and i started you know recording period and then I remember getting more into Pro Tools and then buying like, I don't even know, like Native Instruments had come out or what was it? East West had sampled, like they were the first like orchestral sample packs or something like that. You know? And uh, I was always into it. And I think I reached out and then there was like companies that co started coming out with um, like different companies that would come out with sample packs. And I remember I was talking to somebody the other day in the studio about we were using Superior Drummer. And they were talking about, you remember BFD, you know, that, that sample yeah. pack, the drum pack, you know, I was dying yeah. laughing. And I remember hitting up a, a, uh, a company and I forgot who it was about doing a sample pack. And they just, of course, completely turned me down. And then I thought about it through the years about how would you do a horn sample pack? Because after, you know, taking sample, like learning how to sample and stuff and then how samples are made and then, you know, how many samples for velocities are going to be on one piano note? Like, how would I do that for a horn section? <clears throat> and um, then my buddy, my buddy owns this company called Jam Card, and then he started putting out sample packs with Splice. And then I don't know how he got on the topic. He was like, "Why don't you do a sample pack?" I was like, "Really? That's been a dream of mine forever." <laughs> you know. Uh, and. Uh, so I did it. It was awesome. I finally got to do it. And I, I remember asking, we had a meeting with Splice and I asked about like, you know, do I have to record how many different like velocities do I have to record per note or whatever, you know, all this. And they're like, man, that's way too much. No, you don't have to do any of that. You know? And I'm like, well, yeah. like if I record a phrase or a note 
And the further we get away from the root key, you know, then we're, the degradation, the, you know, it's going to degrade the sound or whatever. And they were like, no, like, we're fine. You don't have to do any of that. Let's just record your stuff. And for them at the time, they were saying a, a lot of their users were, um, were making hip hop stuff that wanted the sound degradation. Hmm. So that was kind of like part of the deal, you know? So yeah, it just, it, it, it took a long time, but not nearly as long as I thought it would take. Hmm. That's something I sometimes, depending on the project, enjoy. I like when it gets stretched and you play those high notes and they have all that kind of weird garbly stuff yeah, that's going what, on. That's what they were saying. Yeah, that's what they're saying is like we a lot of our users love that. So you don't have mm. to do all of that work because it's not necessary, you know. So mm. cool. So about that, if you don't mind getting into some of the kind of weeds with it, um, I mean, because you know you've got a couple different brass instruments in there, right? This, uh, I could see sax, tuba, um, looked like a bunch of other stuff going on. Uh, those are instruments, all of them, really. They, there's so many tones that you can get out of them. Yeah. So many different types of articulations, you know, is it going to be a smooth? Is it going to be kind of like a burst? Is it going to kind of break up a little bit? Uh, are you... Are you doing more kind of like um, passages that people can work with? Are you doing like these instruments people are going to play on their keyboards? Well, what they what they wanted to do was make uh, they wanted to make like kits. So um, it depends on what I would use. Like uh, if I was going to do, let's say, like I have a couple of James Brown kind of vibe lines you know and i try to keep them with like three instruments which would be the trombone the trumpet and the sax which is like typical for a horn section like a pop horn section or anything like that and you know usually or you'd have i or in a lot of stuff i do i have sax trumpet and trombone and i'll have a berry sax to for the low end you know and so they wanted so if i record a phrase then you could have the entire, you know, like even with, um, with contact, some of, I love contact. So some of the contact instruments, if you have like a percussion thing, like a percussion, uh, sample pack, you can press this button and you have the ensemble, like all the percussion mm -hmm. playing that, that loop. And then you have, then you go for this key range and you've got, you know, the tambourines playing here, the congos are playing, you hear that, that, it's, you know, uh, stemmed out basically, you know, you have, right. the, you have the conga stem playing timbali stem, cascada, all that stuff. Uh, so that's what they wanted to do with the horns. And, um, uh, so I did a lot of those, like I would just do lines. So some of them would be like, I think I named them like, um, like JB one or James, you know, for James Brown or something. So the, right. so the user could, could understand the kind of vibe they were going to get went by the name of it. Yeah. Um, Read between the lines a little. <laughs> yeah. I've tried to, I mean, you don't think about how, like I, 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 you know, like you go through all these samples, especially keyboard sounds and you're like, like on Omnisphere or something. And you're just like, there are all these names that you don't ever think about why someone named it what they do, you know, until you make your own sample pack. You're just like, I got to name it yeah. something. You know. Well, why um, is this preset called Floyd Stack? <laughs> you know, for like guitar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that was basically it. And then what I tried to do was um, the it was do like different. So I, I would have a lot of phrases. And so that's like more, most of the sample pack. But then the other section that I, that I don't know how many people have done yet was... Um, like I would, I, I would do like, um, uh, a quarter note, a, a half note, a, a whole note, a fall, a like, um, like two sixties notes, like, uh, da -da, something like that. Um, mm. uh, and then I would do those in unison with different chord qualities, uh, like, you know, uh, 
dominant seven chord here, whatever, like try to just do them, you know, all these different chord qualities, the most common that I could think of that I would use or a songwriter would use. And then I would do them in like, I think like fourths, like, like I would do uh, a C dominant seven and I would do an F dominant seven and all of those things. So then somebody who's going to like piece together a horn section or do a fall, mm-hmm. because a lot of the hip hop stuff and pop stuff I do, um, when I do physical recordings, a lot of people want stabs. A lot of people want like for the chorus, they want like, uh, you know, like a fall, like bow or something like that, you know? And so I, I try to cover all those bases for somebody and they, and it, and it might've turned out to be a too much information for somebody to choose from, but I tried to do my best to give the user like a huge palette of horn stuff that they could use, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Cause it's, it can be pretty specific, obviously. Right. Like if, um, I've got a track, I kind of need it to do a certain thing in a certain amount of time and, um, to have those options would be very helpful. And then I guess if I need to pitch them, it's not too far if you're going by fourths, right? So yeah. if I go down a step or two, like yeah. it'll, it'll work. It'll, it's still kind especially, of there. And then yeah. it, what's cool is like, what was really cool is having, hearing what people did with, with some of these things, you know, like I had a, I had a friend yeah. that, that made this it, amazing song out of one of my lines and i was like wow and it was like got picked up for a commercial i was like that's great i wish i got some nice. <laughs> some of that sync money but whatever no uh because well, you, you're kind of doing like some writing really you're writing riffs and lines and oh yeah little uh motifs that could i'm sure could easily become central ideas in a track yeah they have and that's that's uh um yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the deal with Splice is royalty free, you know, you you know, so I got yeah. gave all that. You got to let go of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. And so, yeah, sometimes with some of the, if I, if I'm writing, if I'm doing horns for uh, somebody's record, every now and then somebody will give me um, credit, which is cool. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's up, it's up to the artist, absolutely, you know, for sure. But if, if the melody the melody is strong enough and it's really an integral part of the song, then, you know, they'll give me credit, which is awesome. That's cool. I think that's the way it should be, honestly. Um, I feel I, like if I'm writing with people, even if they're just in the room, you know, they didn't contribute any of the parts, it would have came out different if they weren't there. It's true, but how many, but, you know, the thing is, is like, especially since remote recording like how many records how many what's the percentage of people that are actually in the room together a Mm -hmm. you know and then and then like the song the original concept of the song which is what the the melody the lyrics and the chord structure like when the song ends up like how much of the production influences the song which a producer might put all these counter melodies on there that weren't there originally but if it's a stronger song now, you know, it's, there's so many variables yeah. with, with that kind of stuff, which is interesting because um, on a side note, like I'm, I'm a member of the Recording Academy, right? So they just started, and I've been for a long time, so the Grammys, which, mm-hmm. you know, Grammys does, does a ton of stuff and, and, and especially like making kind of like standards and influencing legislation for music, right? For musicians and songwriters and composers, whatever. So um, there was a meeting. They just started the songwriting composing wing, which there was a a meeting recently. And uh, one of the big things was like standardization for stuff like I'm telling you, like this, this, this like for composers and songwriters, like how do we standardize? Like, like for producers and engineer wing, an engineer's wing, it's like. Uh, file management, like how there's still not a standard yet. Right. Mm. Um, but for songwriters and composers, just what we're, we, we're just talking about, like what's the standard to give credit. Some people are like, who's in the room. Some people are, you know, it's who is it up to? Mm. Anyway, there was this huge process of trying to standardize 
like have committees and standardize, like make standards for these things that we're talking about. Who gets credit? What? Like make an industry standard. It got abandoned because it was so complicated. Yeah. And it, and people so many. spent a lot of time and, uh, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to create a standard for that. Like they, you know, they can't make a white paper on it, you know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> everything is made so weirdly these days, right? Like there's, it's not like the old days where you had these like specific roles that these people played and people came in and did their job. You know, and like now, one thing that comes to, th one thing that comes to mind, sorry, is uh, uh, like the intro, this was used as an example for a long time for like hearings for like mechanical royalties. Um, uh, the opening, the guitar riff from My Girl, the opening. Uh, mm. bah, everybody in the world knows that opening, right? You know that in like three notes. Right. Yeah. That, that, Name that tune. <laughs> the, the, the person who played that got paid like 50 bucks for that session and died com like destitute, right? Mm. So um, – who there's no standard for that, but it's, that's exactly what you're saying. Like, like, uh, you know, that is such a huge part of that song and nobody's ever going to disagree with that, you know, Yeah. but it probably wasn't the actual, it, it could have easily not have been the, like the, the song when it started, you know, whoever wrote that song or, you know, we could look, but I'm just saying like some of that stuff happens in, in production, you know, mm -hmm. and people don't get credit, which sucks. But then yeah. there's a lot of stuff that happens that doesn't need to be credited. So who makes that decision? You know? Right. That's a, I can understand why they abandoned that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <For sure. laughs> it's trying to account for infinite possibilities. Yeah. There's just no way to know, but that's such a great point. Like, yeah, like that song is a, perfect example like that riff is it's an iconic riff you know and to think that like it was i i guess like a studio musician kind of laid it down and people yeah. hear that <laughs> you don't even need to get to that opening vocal line which is only a couple seconds later to know like oh here comes my girl you know like yeah. that that's such it's such a good riff and that's the like Simple ultimate that's the ultimate beautiful. like example but how many things happen in the studio that the musicians make you know especially back in the day like like that if you saw the making of uh asia that steely dan documentary did you ever see that okay. i haven't seen it no. oh my it, uh chuck rainey <clears throat> was the bass player <clears throat> legendary mm -hmm. new york bass player he lives in texas now but you know, in that documentary, uh, it was like Donald Fagan hated slap bass at the time. And Chuck was like the number one studio musician. He's in the studio. And it's like, what, it, you know, nobody slap a bass around him. It was like the ultimate, like he hated it. And, uh, and then it was like, I forgot what song it was. I think it was Peg. And then he's playing the stuff. And then he turned around so they couldn't see him. So he couldn't see what he was doing and they took it, they had a take and they freaked out. They're like, Oh my God, that was amazing. But he was like doing this like hybrid slap thing and it fit the song yeah. amazing, but he couldn't see that he was slapping, but we, he heard what he let, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> but that was his, you know, he came up with that, mm -hmm. you know, even as he was instructed right. not to, you know? Yeah. <laughs> he made the decision to go yeah. for it. Huh? That's crazy. You do a ton of um, remote recording, and you've been doing it a really long time, right? I mean, oh, man, pretty it's, much. It's. Uh, I think it said you said since two thousand four, right? Yeah. Um, I so, first let me just ask you, like two thousand four. I might even still have like. I don't think I have MySpace yet. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it might be still going on America Online for all i know but um what did it look like back then and it was definitely dial up man i remember um i because i had gone to recording school 
And I had, I was my senior year, I interned, or junior and senior year, I interned at a recording studio in Austin. And the owner didn't, he didn't, he wanted to get rid of the studio. He wanted to sell it because he was just that. He wanted to get out of the studio business. He had a Pro Tools rig. And he had, we, there was like a Tascam tape machine, like, you know, I guess digital audio, you know, it'd been out for a little bit. Pro Tools had been out for a little bit. Um, and so I, I, I bought, I got some investors together and I bought the recording studio and I only owned, owned it for a couple of years and learned so much, but the Austin was getting super popular. It was, the, it was right downtown. It was too expensive to like pay the rent. I was doing like engineering sessions for free just to, and repairing gear constantly, you know, just to pay the bills. And so I had gotten rid of it, but I took the Pro Tools rig home and people started asking me to do sessions and stuff like, oh, you know, uh, can you record horns? And I was like, yeah. So I started recording horns in my bedroom with my Pro Tools rig. And I remember, I remember doing this, like, I don't know how I got sessions from like South America and stuff like that. And there's people in New York or whatever, (laughs) but uh, at that time I was just like, I recorded everything to, I would, first it was like CDs. I would put, make tons of, uh, you'd have to burn like 10 CDs to put all your sessions on, you know, even, you know, I don't even know how many, how many, um, what the storage capability was of a, of a CD ROM back in the day. But, and then, it, and then you got not a lot. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a lot, but I remember mailing people like stacks like of CDs, like 60 or 70 minutes of music. So whatever that is in like waves, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this, yeah. So, um, our sound designer two files, that was what this, you know, that was the proprietary okay, right. pro, pro tools, right? The pro tools files. And, uh, yeah, I would just, and then it was dial up. So, You'd like, I'd have to tell my roommates to like, nobody pick up the phone. I'll disconnect every phone and it would take, you know, I had to run for like two days. Uh, if I was, if I was mailing the sessions, that's one thing, but I remember doing remote sessions, sending files, sessions online. And I was using AOL instant messenger as the file transfer. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, that's what it I was It was almost doing. probably made almost as much sense to just mail it, right? Yeah. Physical. Yeah, but uh, I mean it would take it would sometimes it would take 2 days to transfer a file, but um I mean this is back in Napster too. I remember that. Um but you know, mail would take a week. So if somebody needed a session quick, you know, especially international, yeah. they're not going to get it in time. You know. Right. So that's what it looked like back then. As far as my process, like what I was doing, I was doing the same thing, but technology wise, it was totally different. Hmm. And then the faster things got, the better. Yeah. That must've been right at the beginning of anybody doing any of that kind of stuff. Um, Do you remember the group, the postal service? I don't. Um, I think I was um, the guy from death cab from death cab for cutie. And someone else i don't know the whole story but i think the idea was that it was all remote they record things send it back and forth and i believe it was through the postal service which is why they called it that oh i think i've heard something so, about that it was kind of like almost the gimmick you know yeah. <laughs> of the group that they were doing this thing remote and it i think it was early 2000s that that came out yeah um, i mean i you know i was in it's crazy for me to think that I was one of the first people doing that. You know, like you're never going to assume that you're that smart. <laughs> you know I mean? like, yeah. Two, it was 2003. That record came out. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. So I, yeah, uh, you're right there. I'm never going to, I would never assume <laughs> nice that I was like super smart, but I was in college and I was like trying to kick ass and do as much as I can. And I kind of, mm. I remember I was not a Mac user back then too. So I had to, um, I, I, I built a PC to run pro tools and there was only like this specific motherboard and specific chipset to use. And you had to build your own PC, you had to have a custom PC to run pro tools. 
Um, and then I started building computers for other people and selling them to them to you for that specific purpose. And that kind of, and that kind of supported me for a little while. And then I s switched, um, I switched to Mac, um, a certain point in, and it was so much better, but, um, yeah, it was crazy. Mm. And now it's like, you know, I, I remember having such resistance from people about like, I don't know. You say you can record at home. I don't, I don't know about that. You know, I'm just like, come on, man, really? <laughs> like, I know what I'm doing, you know? Hmm. Uh, and even to this day, I mean, it is, it is possible. Yeah. You know, now everybody can record for home and, and send it and share files, but there's not a lot of people that can do it well, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting to think about those times. Um, and it's super cool that we can do technology has gotten us so far. Uh, and you yeah, know, have you used the, do you use pro tools? No, I started on pro tools. I didn't know anything about computer recording besides pro tools. Mm. So I got my M bucks two, I think it was. Yep. I remember those. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> I yeah I made music kind of in spite of Pro Tools, yeah. <laughs> you know, like against Pro Tools. That's how I always felt. Um, I, I loved it, but I didn't really understand it so well. You know, just I didn't understand computers to be honest with you. At that point, the first time I ever had a computer of my own was I think two thousand five when I got a Mac. Um, yeah. See, but, yeah, I mean, now I, they I have this... got away from it the pro tools now the collaboration thing which is really cool the cloud collaboration thing it's it's pretty neat it's it's uh, not exact it's not exactly real time but it's pretty damn close i mean hmm. um but i was like when i was a little kid man i was a i was a computer nerd i mean before you know i, I you couldn't take classes when i was a kid but i was like five years old and you know, freaking out on Commodore 64. It was like 64K memory, you know? Yeah, that's um, cool. And so, uh, yeah, I always loved computers. And I remember the, the, the college I went to, I was the last class. I went to, I, I got my degree in audio engineering. And it was like one of the first universities that had a bachelor's degree, you know? And they had spent, they had, there was a, it was called a sonic solution system. And that was a two track mastering, uh, kind of DAW it was like a, its own computer. And that was like the first thing that I learned to use. And it was, I remember it was such a big deal because the, the, I think the university spent 30 grand on this computer for the program and it was a two gig hard drive and it was massive, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And then Pro Tools, so I learned digital editing on that on that software, and then Pro Tools came out it was like a multi track, you know, digital editor. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking that it was a lot like uh, Microsoft Word for some reason, like just the copy paste stuff on the two track editor mm -hmm. made a lot of sense to me. So then um, you just had to learn more keystrokes as time went on, and things got things got better, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I I had uh, I started in college as a performance major, and I just I did it for a year, and then I just I kind of had this revelation that I didn't need a piece of paper to tell me I could play an instrument. Yeah, and uh, then the sound this recording program came up, and they just started it, and they said uh, you had to be on scholarship to get in, and you had to have high mm, math, uh, SAT scores they only accepted like 10 people a year and I was like, well, I'm not going to do this performance thing. And I've recorded music in a recording studio before. So I'm going to try this and I got accepted and I went through it and that's kind of what I do now, you know? Mm. And I remember in, in recording school, uh, Willie Nelson's longtime engineer was our, one of, was our like, um, he was kind of the studio guy, like he ran the studio and, and he said, it, you know, if you want to be a, a studio engineer, you want to be a producer, you want to be a studio musician, I'm just going to tell you right now, 
it's going to be a hard life. So you might as well, you know, throw away these dreams of having a family or doing this or doing that, you know, and you got to pick one. You can't do all of them. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I can pick one. I'm cool with letting everything Mm. else go, but I love recording so much and I love playing live so much. I don't want to pick one. I want to do both. I want to do all of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, Thankfully, it, uh, I still do both. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. So you're really kind of like, you've been on the edge of what's been going on. You know, it's kind of riding the wave of the changing industry, really. Yeah. Um, so you said you, you were working at it, you bought the studio, I working did. at that for a while. Um, then it goes mobile from there. Yeah. Or out of your bedroom. Yeah. Um, which, which is awesome. You know, like now that people forget, like now, like you can do all this stuff on your phone, you can do quite a lot. But uh, at that time, that was new. That was exciting. And there was a lot of people saying that that can't be done. Um, what happens with you next? You know, backtracking a little, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, because I just think it's so awesome how you've pulled this all together. Um, you're, you know, you're doing the, all the things you love, really. You, you're playing yeah. crazy tours, you know, some of the biggest acts there are and the biggest places that you can play in front of queens and Man, <laughs> you know, music you know, royalty. I, I, it was an interesting time. I mean, you're, you, you know, I was a kid and literally, like, I started, I loved horn sections and music with horn sections when I was growing up. And I wanted to do that. And I met the guys that I played with. They were in, they were going to the university of North Texas, like badass horn players. And I was still in high school when we met. And by chance, the trumpet player ended up stranded in uh, San Marcos, Texas, where I was going to school. Well, when I was going to college, his band played there and they left him and he became my roommate. And he was a badass wow. trumpet player from the University of North Texas, which is top music school in the world, probably second to Berkeley, you know. Um, and he ended up like, by chance, being stranded, living with me. And I remember sitting out in front of one night after some show we had played together. And I said, I've got it. We're sitting outside looking at the stars. I was like, we're going to start a horn section. We're going to play on everybody's record. Because the only, like thing that I had in my mind prior at that time. I mean, this is like, I don't know what was popular back then, maybe the end of grunge or I don't even know what was going on, but horn sections were definitely not in style. Right. So, mm-hmm. but I, but I tower of power was like all over it. Like, you know, you would see Huey Lewis and you see these videos with this badass horn section. And, and, uh, I was like, we are going to, put a horn section together and we're going to tour with all the biggest artists in the world. And we're record on everybody's records because also back in the day when you had CDs, you remember, I'm sure you did this, like every record that you love, you would study those liner notes and know everybody that's playing on that record. Yeah. That was a huge thing, you know? Yeah. And, this is my literature. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, man, and people ask me all the time, like, how did you get this? And how do you get, this? and man, I, I didn't know anybody in the music industry. Nobody. I didn't know how I was going to do it. All I knew was like, my intent was to do that. And somehow, I mean, we, there's a process of like what I, but we were kids. We didn't know what we were doing. And we started, we started playing at this, like sitting in at this all black club and on sixth street in Austin. And we're literally the only non black people there and they and they those bands like taught us how to play really and Mm -hmm. then we started playing with rock bands in austin and doing all this stuff and then i meet jason mraz and then i you know people are fans of bands that i play in and they're pop stars or whatever you know and uh that's kind of how that happened and i i but i i there's a lot of times that i had opportunities to leave and not do that, not do the horn section thing. And I had had this like crazy sense of like loyalty to my, my guys and the, the idea 
And I, they didn't know anything about recording. They were horn players. So I was the like, like always learn. I was learning how to record horns at the time and like experimenting, but it was just me doing it. It wasn't like they're pushing me to do this, you know? And I remember the first massive tour I was going to be on was the Eagles. And I was probably 23 years old and nice manager's name was um harry sand no harry harry i, I forgot it was sandler maybe i don't even know I, I but um he was calling me from la horn sections you know we're that's our first big gig they're paying us an outrageous amount of money we're kids we're like yeah we're doing this and then he calls me like I don't know, two months before the, uh, the tour is about to start. And he said, Hey, we're going to go a different direction with the horn section. And I was like mortified. I was like, Oh my God. He said, um, we're just going to use a sax player. You, you, you're interested. I mean, you're the guy, so you're going to take it. Right. And I was like, I can't take it. He's like, what? I'm like, hmm. they, man, there, I think they were, I was probably 23, 24 years old. They were going to pay me six grand a week. Like back then, like, come on. And one of the biggest bands in the world. And I didn't, I turned it down. I probably cried that night, seriously. And I didn't tell anybody for like 10 years. I didn't tell my horn players. I didn't tell them because they would have, you know, my, my best friends, they would have, uh, whatever. I didn't want them to feel guilty. I didn't want, you know, Yeah. but that could have changed my entire life in a good way or a bad way. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Right. But you know, there's mm. tons of stories that I have like that, but I'm perfectly happy with where I am in my career. You know, I've made mistakes, big mistakes and I've made really smart choices. So, and that's just, just the way it is. And I, I'm, I don't think you always strive. I mean, you're probably the same way. Like we're artists and it's like, we're, we're always going to try to do the best thing that we've ever done. Cause we're chasing this, like this thing, whether it's a recording or a song or a feeling, whatever it is that we're never going to get. Yeah. It's always on the horizon. Yeah. <laughs> and that's our life. You know, I still, I, I, there's so many things that I still want to do and so many songs that I want to write, so many horn arrangements that I want to do that are better than this. And, you know, it's never going to stop. And why that's like a realization I made a long time ago. So I just, I have to be happy with where I'm at. And I, I do feel very, very, very lucky and very blessed that, uh, you know, I think, being a musician and choosing that life, whether you're uh, whatever, a producer, an engineer, a studio musician, a performer, a writer, it's a hard life, period. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, so the chances of being successful, you're already, you're already screwed out the gate. You don't go to college and immediately <laughs> you're going to get a job. Like you go to law school, you become a lawyer. That's pretty much the end of it, you know? And you yeah. make tons of money, you have a comfortable life. There you go. Uh, for us, it's not like that, you know? And especially, I didn't choose an instrument that everybody needs. And I I didn't, I'm not playing that instrument, like, traditionally, like, you know, everybody that goes, to, you know, 90% of the saxophone players that graduate Berkeley can play giant steps in a million keys, you know? That's not me. I'm mm-hmm. this guy you know? So I'm really lucky that somehow I figured out, uh, my own kind of niche and it's, you know, it's working. So. Yeah. I I would have to imagine being a little different than that is its own strength. Yeah. You're, you're that guy for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You Crazy. know, um, the the paper thing is interesting um i i I get a ton of great students in my class my class is such a small picture of any of this stuff at berkeley but um 
every once in a while you get somebody that for all I know, they might just be turning in the same assignment that they've had for four years. They might just be kind of saying they're doing what they're doing. And it's hard to tell. You can't always tell if they're using the techniques and all that. And it's like, what are you trying to do here? You know, like, it's like you said, this piece of paper isn't going to really do anything for you. Maybe, maybe people like look at you, you know, but um, like, it's not you do this and then my job as an English teacher, like you can get a job as an English teacher, right? So, but you can't cheat your way through this. It, like there's so much more, this, you gotta be so hungry for it. And really, you gotta be lucky, hungry, you gotta be able to stand out. And, you know, this idea like, okay, if you're like cutting corners here, like, there's almost no sense in me stopping you because <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> like that that's its own dead end, that kind of attitude, that kind of work ethic. You know, you know it's like I feel like I met a I've been work I met this guy recently that moved to Austin from or, from Orlando and I've been talking about him a lot. Um because he's like twenty eight years old. And right after the pandemic, any of the shows that I was playing in town were kind of like bigger shows of artists around. And I remember seeing this guy always like, I would see him consistently on the side of the stage. And he's like this tall black guy, very unique looking. And he was always just super excited. Like he would, I, I would come off stage. He'd be like, so thankful, like excited, like a kid, like, Oh my God, you're so like, thank you, sir. And like super respectful. And I'm just like, I, that, that's awesome that you love what I'm doing, but you don't have to, you know, take it easy. It's fine. You know, it's not a big deal, you know, <laughs> whatever. And then he consistently, he would do this. And I was like, and then I find out. So there's a rumor in Austin about these two guys that moved, whatever moved into town. They're just killing musicians, just monsters. And then I mm -hmm. find out that this is that guy. And I'm, and then he plays. He's like a one of the best drummers in the world. He plays with this guy Bob James, uh, the amazing piano player, New York New York guy that did the theme song for Taxi way back. <laughs> um, and he's a monster songwriter, like monster. And we've been writing together, but this and he's got this energy and like this like he doesn't really care about playing. He wants to be in the studio, make creating, and he's writing all these great lyrics and these awesome melodies. And he's got this excitement. And I'm just, I tell everybody, I'm like, this dude is going to take over the world. Like there's no option. Like you could just tell, <laughs> you know? So it's like you, not only is he so hungry that he will move anywhere on the planet. He will talk to anybody He's going to, the way, the reason he got so good at everything is because he wanted it so bad and you can mm. tell, and he's, you know, so it's just like what you were saying. It's like, you have to want it. You have to want it like you and be willing to sacrifice so many things. It's not like, I think that's what sets people apart, I guess, you know, I mean, that's the only common denominator I can think of because if you second guess yourself, there's too many other people in front of you that want it, but worse, you know? Yeah. And that's a fun energy to be around. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, that's, in, that's what we're dealing with really. We're, we're <laughs> energy, yes. right? We're creating energy with this, the sounds, the songs, the keys we're in, we're creating moods. You need, you, you just can't be like dull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uninterested and unenthusiastic. Yeah, uh, in in that kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. It's, anyway, yeah, you got to be like fun to be around, fun to share that with. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a yeah, it helps for sure. Being fun to be around definitely helps. There's a lot of people that aren't that fun to be around. <laughs> <So too>. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess if you're at that level and other people are at that level too that it can very well be the difference um yeah i i always tell the story about 
when I got my job as a teacher, I came in and you know, I'm like 25, I guess, out of college. No idea what I'm doing, you know? And I wanted to seem like I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. So I'd ask for help, even though I felt a little bit embarrassed, but I needed it. Yeah. Um, by asking for help, I realized one, it made people think I cared, which I did. And it also showed respect. Like if I said, Carlos, like you've really got this figured out. Can you help me out with something? I got a question for you. It's like, oh, well, thank you. You, you know, it feels good to be, you know, respected in that way that somebody wants to know your opinion and thinks that you can help them. You know, someone says, can I get your advice? You're kind of always like, yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you yeah, hear what for I sure. Think? Cool. That's, that's true, man. I, I was riding with James the other, like first time he came into my house, he looked at my, I've got these massive screens right in front of me. I can see, you can't see them, but for my, 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 my studio rig is like the massive screens in front of me. And he looks and he's looking at my, he's looking at my horn panning because I'm playing a session that I had just done for some artist. And, uh, he's like, I'm just looking at your painting. He's like, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I'm doing it right. And then he was like, that's how you do your background vocals too. Cause when I produce records, it's the same as like a background vocal section, you know, treat them. I treat them the same. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, he's like, cool. I'm doing it right. And then, you know, he, I've heard him say a lot. He's like, man, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm here, man. I'm always learning stuff from you. I'm like, that's awesome. That's so great. Yeah. This kid's such a badass cool. already, you know? And, I, yeah. and it's like, I don't, you know, what can, everything I learned, yeah, I went to school and did a, like all that stuff, but it's like, you can't, you, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you got to create and learn on your own before you can't read it in a book. You can't do the exercises mm -hmm. and just think that it's going to happen. You got to do it. Yeah, you know. I've tried. <laughs> 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 I've read manuals and watched tutorials and taken courses and thinking like just the knowledge will show up. But yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> you have to, you learn a lot more putting it into action. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a slippery slope because it feels like you're being productive. It feels like you're doing work, you know, when you're reading, when you're learning, when you're all that stuff but it there's nothing like getting to it i always think about like the first time i learned how to do a uh what is it like a riser on a mm -hmm. uh, do you know probably taking your class or whatever i, I was think like, there was a week on risers yeah. in anticipation yeah i was <laughs> like this is the coolest thing ever because <laughs> you know? yeah. i've i've i'd heard that with like electronic music for so long it was just Mm -hmm. I was like, how does that happen, you know? Uh, I tell you what, I learned a lot from that myself because I'd start to realize like, oh, yeah, oh, that was a cool thing they did. That was a good one. I liked that. And then you start to understand like all these elements you can play around with. And I mean, really, it's it's contrast. That's almost everything with music really yeah. is like some sort of contrast between elements so if you're trying to rise to a larger place start real small start you give yourself room it's so cool to <laughs> and, like and there's able, a lot of ways you can do it it's so cool to be able to use those things like um you know of course i i learned that stuff from the ableton class but it pretty much just all the of course all of that stuff uh it carries over to any 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 um i mean i could use i could do the same thing in contact you know any mm -hmm. midi software and create it's a concept yeah. yeah and yeah. using them in records that i produce you know it's really cool it's like of course you can go to splice and like download that thing or find it you know but then when i'm in the studio people are like i'm like oh yeah well let me make this drop really quick where i get this like you know this like huge bass drop before the downbeat of the of a song before the downbeat of the chorus, you know, to have this effect. But just, well, let me just program this real quick. And then I do it. And they're just like, how did you do that? Well, <laughs> my friend, Brian Funk is a teacher <laughs> at Berkeley. I learned it from him. Yeah. So. 
That's cool. How cool is it too to have, you know, like like Jason Mraz come in and look at your session and then say, Oh, I'm doing it right. Like <laughs> just that kind of like authority that he's implying you have on this. You know, that you like if I'm doing it the way Carlos is doing it, then I'm good. Man, I can't tell you how humbled I am when things like that happen. I you know, the studio that I, I started I started working um, when I lived in that house. That's in 2000, I think eight was when Raz's or 2009 when I'm yours came out and he was working with this producer in London. His name is Martin Terefe. And Jason asked me, it was in passing. I said, I can record horns for you anytime from my house. Like this is where I kind of like trying to get the word out. And I just thought it was in one ear and out the other. And he called me from London one day and he was like, Hey man, remember when you said you could record horns from my, your house? And I was like, yeah, he was, can I send you something? I'm in London right now. I'm working on a disco record. And I was like, yeah, send it to me. Like, yes, yes. Yeah. You know? And, uh, Martin was, you know, he was a massive producer I and mean, that's when he was starting to get all his hits. You know, now he owns this whole studio complex. It's so brilliant over there. But I ended up doing like Backstreet Boys from like he would produce every record that he would do. He would send me stuff from London after Jason. And he was so shocked at what he and Jason just recently said this story on social media, too. And it's really funny. You got to see it. But he says, I met Carlos in Austin, Grooveland Horns, asked, sent him a song and to see what he would do with it. And he sent it back to me in 24 hours. Like I was so excited. I called the dudes over to my house. I was like, let's kill this. And we murdered it. And I literally finished, like did everything in like four hours and sent it to London immediately. And he, and so he says, and I don't remember this when I, that I knew I was so cocky about what I'd said that I knew was so killing that when they opened the email in London, my opening statement was, I guess I'm in your band now. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he laughs about it because he was like, he knew it was killing before he sent it to me. And we opened it and we were like, oh my God, it was amazing. you know. But uh, I had done all these records with Martin after that. Um, not exactly sure what my point is with that, but uh, I th what I don't remember what we were talking about. Oh, just oh, my, my the thing was is when I, I had done probably like twenty massive records with Martin before I went to London and went physically to that studio. And by the time I got there, like I walked in, and this is a massive studio in London, right? All of the engineers and all the like they were like, "Yes, sir." Like what kind of mics would you use? And you know, whatever. And like, where, where do you want to, and I'm like, well, what are you talking about? Like they were asking me how I wanted to be recorded because my stuff was so good. Like their, their perception of my process was so awesome. And I was so nice. humbled, like, man, I recorded that in my bedroom, hmm. you know, with like a 421 and a 414. And then I, use the same 414 for the sax because I didn't have three mics, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, this, is, and they're just like, it, it's just such a humbling experience when, when stuff like that happens to me, man. Cause I, I, I just do the best I can and hope that it turns out great. You know, that's hysterical. So you're in this fancy studio and they're like, how can we make this like your bedroom? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Have, like every U47 known to man and like all these great compressors right. and stuff. I was like, I didn't use any compressors. I've got like a Radio Shack 57, you know? <laughs> you got a twin mattress anywhere? <laughs> We're going to need that. <laughs> we need some sheets. We're going to hang on the wall. Your, your gobos aren't really cutting it. <laughs> hey, that's a testament though to your work. I mean, and it's a great takeaway, you know, like turn in your best work. Do go that extra mile. Yeah. Like, and the fact that you turned it in in a day too, that's big. You know, you don't they don't want to be waiting for you and to keep the project moving. Yeah, that kind of became my my like my my calling card kind of thing. Like I wanted everybody to 
I wanted people to get the files back and it'd be like Christmas. Like they open this mm-hmm. file and they're like, Oh my God, this is amazing. You know, that's, and I wanted it to happen quick. I wanted it to be like, and then when I met Fraser T. Smith, that guy I was talking about that still takes Berkeley classes, he was like, he knew that I'd been working with Martin for a long time. And he goes, so wait, I just send you an, like an MP3 and then you're going to send me back a whole horn arrangement with just done, finished, edited. And I was like, yeah, that's bloody brilliant. He's like, that's amazing. <laughs> like, he's like, I love yeah. that. So he started sending me tons of stuff. And I guess the, the value still to this day, you know, unless you're like on what's that sound better or something and you know this person's work, it's hard to trust somebody to like, to give you a quality product, you know? And, but they don't have to hire an arranger in the real world. You have to hire an arranger to arrange the parts. You have to hire the musicians to play the parts. You don't know if they play together or not. And you have to get the studio time and then you have to spend the time doing it. So it's all this money or you can send it to this one guy that's going to take care of it, all of it for you, and it's killing, you know? Right. Next day, like Amazon Prime. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like all in one. <laughs> yeah, man. So That's sick, man. It certainly explains your success and why people want to work with you so much. Oh, thanks, man. I mean, I try to do the same thing, like kind of take the same approach when we – play with new bands live like someone wants to hire there's a couple of amazing artists that want to book us for next year and i'm just like i try to do the same thing like we have a month till rehearsals with zach brown and i'm just plowing through like like memorizing stuff and like we're getting together constantly because by the time we get there we don't want anybody to have to think twice about what we're doing Hmm. you know like we got to be on top of our game and at that level you can't afford to be noticed. Hmm. You know what I mean? You can't, there is nothing. You have no problems. Your life is perfect and you know, every note of what's going to happen and you're completely prepared. Uh, but they Do you all, have to write for that? Man, the range? I, man, I'd, I'd already played with Zach um, before. So I'd already done most of the work. Then now I just got to remember what I did. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so I'm, that's what I'm kind of doing right now. And so, I mean, I had done so much work and I don't, I was talking to some of the guys in the band, like by the time when you can be as prepared as you want with Zach. And there's a lot of artists like this. He's, he's definitely special. Uh, but you can't ever be prepared enough because that guy's going to throw a curveball because he, He's going to be like, oh, yeah, well, let's do this. And why don't we just go, like, do some crazy, like, crazy things that nobody would ever do. This guy will come up with, and the band has to be right there with him. And I remember, Mm -hmm. like, at rehearsals, my bone player was getting so pissed because I was moving so fast because I was thinking with him, he wants to make all these changes. So I'm, like, I'm the leader of my horn section, so I'm with him. And I'm writing all this stuff, and then he's pissed off because I'm going so fast that he can't keep up with me, but I'm trying to keep up with Zach. I don't have time to worry about him. You know what I mean? Because the artist wants their stuff to happen and the inspiration right there, and you have to be good enough to be able to give it to them. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, So that's – I always – like I guess that that's a common denominator between me doing my recording stuff and my arranging – and like, and then doing go and playing live is like at that level, I have to be steps ahead and just do, deliver the best product world-class immediately that nobody can do, you know, like, I mean, there's yeah. definitely people, other people that can do it as well or better, but you just have to have that mindset that you have to, you're getting paid a lot of money. You're lucky to be here. And if you don't do it, if you don't, if you don't deliver at a super high level, somebody else will. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Stay on top of the game. Yeah. I love it, man. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I wish yeah, I could share audio like, with you, man. man uh, it sucks. What's a, just great 
almost like core takeaways, honestly, for like anything a person wants to do in life. <laughs> you know, if you can come with that kind of, seriously, like yeah. if you can come and bring those elements, um, you know, it's the, uh, I think it was Steve Martin, so good they can't ignore you. Just, yeah, this is it. This is this is the way we do it. <laughs> and we, we're functioning at this level so we can get the job done and see your vision through. Yeah. That that is like Christmas. <laughs> it's like getting what you want for Christmas. Man, I got a good <laughs> I got a really good Steve Martin story for you real quick. Um Yeah, cool. We're play we're playing Saturday Night Live. And uh and who are you playing with? Jason Mraz. A while back. Uh Steve Martin is a is a guest as well. And uh, he is promoting his uh, bluegrass record. Yeah. Uh, he's a killing banjo player, right? And so we're at Soundcheck. We're exhausted. And Lenny Pickett is the m musical director. He's like the, I'm a, like his biggest fan. And he, like, we're doing Soundcheck and he's walking around looking at my saxophone, like, I wasn't I, I wasn't playing at the time, but he was checking out the horns, walking around, just like looking. And then I put on my saxophone and then he comes up and he shakes he puts his hand out to shake my hand and he's like, I'm Lenny Pickett. I was like, Oh man, I know exactly who you are. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm you're he's my idol. But anyway, Steve Martin grabs his banjo, Jason's up there. I don't know if Jason knew that Steve Martin was there, but he walks up. We're all in position. He walks up to Jason and he's like all happy. And he's like, grab his bed. He goes, somebody said I was sitting in with you guys. And Jason's like shocked that Steve Martin walks up to him. Like he had no idea. And he's like a deer in headlights. And he's like, uh, no, nobody told me anything. And Steve Martin is like, okay, then. And turned around and left. And Jason was like mortified. He's like, wait, <laughs> no. I didn't mean leave. Like I, he was just like, it was just this, this. And mm -hmm. so Jason was, yeah, it doesn't happen every day. <laughs> <laughs> he was mortified for the next like five hours that he had just pissed off Steve Martin and lost this huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was a funny moment. Eventually they, they straightened it out, but it was funny. And did he play with you guys? No, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, what are you doing in that situation? You turn around and, and Steve Martin's there. and What? <laughs> you know, yeah, what's going on? Exactly. Man, I got stories for days. Yeah. It's funny. But, uh, hmm. yeah. Well, it's been awesome catching up with you. I don't want to keep you all night no I'll, I'll i care, have man. a feeling i i very well could but uh <laughs> we should definitely direct people to check out your splice pack on uh, groove line horns yeah which i'm gonna have links for but i'm sure if they just if you're using splice just type that in it'll come right up um you're on so many records uh any recent ones you want to oh tout man. or uh yeah there's some recent ones um I just posted this yesterday. One of the coolest things I ever did wrote, or I've ever done, which is, and I love it, is I'm on this song called Ratata, Ratata, I don't know how to say it, but it's a Skrillex track. Uh, okay. Skrillex and Missy Elliott. So it's his latest record. Nice. Uh, I heard that. And it's an amazing song. I love it. And then I figured out, like, one of her hits, like the hit, the song where she, um does the thing backwards she says that phrase backwards i don't know what song it is it's a you know what i'm talking about yeah uh this song this I'll entire song that, it, that skrillex did um uh, and i played on is created out of one of her lines in that song oh it, like a sample no it's like a line of her song she says this thing and then he wrote this song because of that line. It's really cool. I didn't even know oh, it until cool. I listened to him. Mm. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, one of the, 
thing I did that last year and it just came out. It's is that saxophone? Yeah. They had me do a like kind of he had me redo a sample that he liked. Mm. And uh it's cool. And then nice. uh I got a children's record coming out in August of this year under my name, which will be the first thing in me and this, uh, my partner is, his name's Coy Bowles, B O L B O W L E S. Um, he's the guitar player for Zach Brown and, uh, it'll be under both our names. And I don't really have anything under my name as a writer, like, a, or an artist, but that will be. So mm. that'll come out in August. Um, the last record that we did together is only under his name, but it's called Music for Tiny Humans on Spotify and Apple Music. And hmm. it's a great record. Um, what is, what uh, inspired that? And uh... Koi is a, he was a published children's book writer already. Like he's written several children's books. Um, and he's kind of in education and like, you know, he, he just loves it and being a part of it in, in especially in the state of Georgia. And, um, we were playing, uh, I think it's soldier field. I don't know. Um, no, I don't know what the, the, um, we're playing base. We're touring baseball stadiums. Anyway, we were talking about writing music and he goes, Hey, one day he came to me on my bus. He said, Hey man, you want to write a children's song? And I was like, <laughs> Cool whatever, let's do it. So we went into the locker room and brought my, my, uh, pro tools rig. Uh, and we recorded our first song that we wrote together in a locker room of a baseball stadium. And then the writing process was so cool with us. We just, I went to his house. He's got an amazing recording studio and, uh, we just started writing and writing and writing and writing. And we, we just started writing and uh, writing and writing. We had, great chemistry together and um and he he's got a good like there's a there's a um there's a animated app a series for apple that he's that we're pitching i mean he is but based on our music and the books that he's written so that might come to fruition i mean children's music is awesome for me because uh you get to you can really do anything you want in songwriting, but with children's music, there's no limits at all. You can do so many fun things that you couldn't really do in pop, you know? Mm. Um, That's really cool. I had a little experience in something similar. Um, my friend and I, he's a special education teacher and musician, and we did songs for really intended for like people, young kids with autism. Wow called social story songs and the idea is social stories teach them how to behave in context so like um if it might be like a story about going to the restaurant right. what to expect you know yeah you know things like that so we made these songs to teach things use your inside voice was one um that's cool and um i it was such a fun experience in and the thing came together so fast. It was the first thing I'd ever done where I didn't think as like an artist, you know, again, like this being too clever, being, you know, expressing myself, like all that was done was just have fun. The, we need catchy songs and we need to have a point to them. And it was such a blast. And it, it was a huge turning point for me in songwriting and just writing music in general that to take the things you'd learned in the craft and apply it to this kind of mission man i tell you i, I learned so much too man it, it it made things it kind of opened my mind to like like i mean it's not like it's not like a, somebody with a guitar like you know playing acoustic and singing you know like john denver songs it's like Mm -hmm. produced well and like we have but the things like uh even the the first record we hired like all of like a choir and all these badass musicians and string sections and whatever and then this new record we decided to like do it all by ourselves like we're gonna play everything we're gonna sing everything we're gonna program everything you know whatever we're gonna do it all by ourselves 
And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't take classes like yours, you know? Um, but the chances that I can take now and all the, like the, it's just, uh, with, they're like pop songs and they're cool mm -hmm. pop songs because we're taking so many chances because the, you know, it's like when you write pop songs, like the cool stuff happens when you do step out of the box and take big chances. But with children's music, it's already given that you can do that and nobody's going to judge you because they're children and it's going to be cool sounds. And then by the end of the day, you write the song, the album's done and you're just like, man, that's so cool. That could have been a, that could be a pop song, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to hear that. Yeah, man. I'll send you some stuff, but it, that's on Spotify. The first record's already done, but I love the second record. It's going to be great. And, uh, there's as of course, Jason Mraz's last record. Um, I am on, and uh, Zach Brown just released a live record, and there's a version of uh, "Sweet Emotion" with Steven Tyler singing it live at Fenway Park. What that I'm on, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, so it's live at Fenway Park. Uh, Zach Brown Band, uh, "Sweet Emotion." Yeah. Wow. I, I, Aris was one of my favorite too. Yeah, so, dude, you can in imagine, Boston. <laughs> you can imagine when uh Steven Tyler walked in, I was just like, Jesus Christ, this is awesome. Yeah, he's a rock star, huh? <laughs> he is, man. When we played that gig, we were just doing that song. I had never in my life seen anybody have that many people in the palm of their hand. Like he Yeah. Everybody was like right here for Steven Tyler. Yeah. It was awesome to see. And to be a part of yeah. like shit. I, I was in I was in the band like he, you know. Right. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I had seen Aerosmith with a buddy of mine play in um Foxwoods Casino in I played there, yeah. Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Small place. Yeah. So what a cool place to see Aerosmith play. And afterwards in the casino, he was just out like playing, you know, <laughs> roulette and stuff <laughs> awesome. but what really struck me was like the way he interacted with people like like you said they're in the palm of their hand but when he was talking to somebody they were the only person in, in the whole universe it was really kind of amazing because here's a guy like you think he can be looking he doesn't have time for anybody but the way he really interacted with the people it was just it was cool to just watch him that's just, cool just man. playing roulette you know, talking to people i'll tell you man somebody told me that recently and not to remotely compare myself to steven tyler but um somebody told me that like they it was uh that they met me in portland after a show and i don't even remember this and that i was so that they felt like that they're like i can't believe you took the time to speak to me and i'm like what are you talking about like, what? Well, no, you're just so busy and whatever. And, and you're like, you were so nice. And I felt like you were, you just like really cared. And I'm like, well, I mean, from my perspective, I'm just a sax player, but regardless, like I, uh, I'm really grateful for people to come out to see me play or mm. to like what I do. Like it's important to me. So if why wouldn't I be respectful and grateful and treat you like you're important because you are important. You like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm lucky to be doing what I'm doing and you like what I'm doing. And that's a massive gift to me. So if I, the least I could do is be nice and sweet and engaging to you, you know? Yeah. And that's a great attitude to have. It doesn't happen without those people. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. So, well, man, thank you so much for having me. I mean, this has been awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you ever, maybe one day I can figure out this, uh, update my operating system so we can share some audio. <laughs> yeah. yeah, of course. It'd be great to catch up with you again. It's been really nice to talk with you after a few years now. Yeah. And, um, yeah, this is a great excuse to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> so. man. I appreciate I'm so it. happy for you. All your success, your story is great. It's inspiring. There's powerful lessons for, like I said, anyone that wants to do anything. 
really? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like what you've done, um, it's kind of no wonder you're, you're seeing the results and the fruits of your labor are paying off like this. It's great. Thanks, man. Um, so we'll send people to your work. Yeah. You want to get some, some Carlos in your music, check out the splice pack. Or, and, uh, or, re or, or reach out to me. <laughs> or reach out to him. Yeah. 24 hour turnaround. <laughs> but, <laughs> I guess, I don't know if that's in the a guarantee, but yeah, reach out. Um, we'll put all that contact info in there. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Thanks, and thank you everyone for listening. Nice. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.